Hi, so since 2016, and possibly probably before that, there's been a movement to quote unquote deplatform people who are considered extremists online. And we can just simplify the issue by the following argument, which is that when you're dealing with a Nazi and a non Nazi, you don't have to give the Nazi equal time. In fact, what you have to do is not give the Nazi equal time. You have to take a stand and by not choosing one over the other and by not censoring the Nazi, you're not promoting free speech, you're doing the opposite because you're not taking a stand. So let's talk about that argument. Um, the first question, of course, is who gets to decide who the Nazis are? Um, if there's anything that, that makes free speech worthwhile, it's in the collision of different ideas that allows intellectual growth. Um, if I'm sitting at a table with Seth Waxman and several other people, and there's a discussion about the law, I would expect if I'm contradicted by Seth Waxman, who was a legal expert and who should have been on the Supreme Court, I would expect to be corrected. And in, in being corrected, I would, would expect to grow and to grow in a way that allows me to remember my mistake. It's a windy day here today in San Jose, California. So if I am corrected by somebody who's simply better than I am on a particular subject, I'm probably going to be um, for that mistake. other than a show a, or, or a scripted show, we should accept the fact that free speech also means that people get embarrassed in the process of dialogue, especially if they're going to take an extremist viewpoint or an incorrect viewpoint in front of somebody who knows more than he or she does, than they do. So now, if you have a conscience and you're corrected, there's a, a lot, there are quite a few benefits. So one of them obviously is that you're not going to make that same mistake again. And secondly, you're probably going to do the best you can to correct other people who are making the same mistake. Because chances are you've got that incorrect information or information out of context somewhere. And now there's going to be a self-propelling drive to go back and fix the trail of mistakes. Now, the argument that the other side is making against free speech and for a deep and for deplatforming is what do you do when the person who was corrected has no conscience and will continue to make the same arguments over and over again, either because they have no conscience or because they're being funded by sources, whether domestic or foreign, that are attempting to destabilize social cohesion. And that's the argument that's really being made when you say, when people say, listen, you don't want to give a Nazi equal time, you have to take a stand and censor viewpoints that are extremist so you don't allow the ideological terrorists to hijack the conversation. Let's talk about that. If now we all know that it's even more difficult today to determine the veracity of content. You can manipulate photos, you can manipulate almost anything. So I can make take a statement and provide evidence that's either out of context and or just simply Photoshop something that is false. And in doing so, provide the veneer of evidence that supports whatever extremist claim I'm trying to make. And both sides do this. The quote unquote good guys and the bad guys do the same thing. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if there are photos of the Holocaust that are inauthentic. 
not very many, obviously, but it wouldn't surprise me one bit. So if you have the good guys doing this and the bad guys doing this, and this happens even more so with, with cameras, you can do angling in a way that, you know, or shadowing in a way that makes it more, far more difficult to see somebody in a positive light. You can obviously edit in a way that takes somebody's statements out of context. And now, even with spoofing and with other technological advances, you see, you have a, this guy over there is unfortunately trying to get my attention. Um, <laughs> and even with spoofing and everything else, you know, you also have a problem of deep fakes where you can take anybody, assuming you have enough data on that person. And this is obviously true of any, of any public figure. You've got the voice data, you've got enough video, you've got enough images, and you can simply superimpose whatever you want onto that person. And in doing so, essentially destabilize the conversation. So that's not an argument for deplatforming. That's an argument for authenticity. That's an argument for forensic science. That's an argument for technology to fix the problems that it's made. It's not an argument to censor anybody. And if the problem is you've got some people who are manipulating images on both sides, then no one's hands are clean. And furthermore, the ease with which this is being done and it's being done all over, by the way. There are, there's a video uh, being posted on a nonprofit that I saw on a nonprofit Middle Eastern website on Twitter, a social media platform that has, is clearly um, has, uh, fake. Uh, it, it superimposed a group of Israeli, uh, I believe, soccer fans, sports fans. Uh, I don't know exactly the uh, what the sport is, but. They're cheering wildly and they've got their phones in front of them, taking photos and so on. And in, the, in, in front of them is a military operation against probably the Gaza Strip or the Palestinians with explosions and so on. And this is obviously, you know, I mean, it's defamation for sure, but it's just terrible in every other way as well. And I can see it. and it, and, and, and you know, initially, if you don't understand that images and video can be manipulated, you're outraged because remember, you're looking at a nonprofit site that actually has what's called a blue check mark next to it. So in other words, it's passed the content screening or the, I guess the verification screening process for one of the world's largest social media platforms. So you look at that and then you look at the, the images of the cheering fans and they're holding on, on their phones, they're actually holding up uh, images of the bombing. In other words, whoever did this is so expert, such an expert, that they were able to e even replace the images on the fans, sports fans phones with the, whatever images that they wanted you to see in order to make this lie even more believable. So when you look at that, that's not, a censorship issue that is an authenticity issue and the only way to fix that technological flaw is through technology there has to be a way to figure out which images have been manipulated and this is obviously difficult because most images that are posted are going to be edited in some way but once you start putting together different images there ought to be a way to for ai or something else to get in there and figure out what's happened and then and, and then ban that specific content but not the speaker because the speaker might be making an honest mistake a lot of these social media platforms you know, and they may have one dedicated person but chances are that it might be a college intern some 18 year old you know who's not necessarily an expert who's just there to make sure that something is online and some social media presence is online that, that attracts eyeballs. And that's the other problem. Once again, it's not a free speech issue, it's that 
the advertising dollars have figured have decided that quality is not as important as quantity and so when you seek eyeballs as opposed to understanding of course you're going to have problems because then if i am somebody that we'll call we'll call it a nazi or some anybody that wants to destabilize social cohesion all you have to do at that point is boost through your advertising dollars you know the content that is fake but that does not appear to be fake or that is simply outrageous and this has been going on for a long time it's been going it's been happening on what's called reality quote-unquote television where essentially you have actors who are following a script but the audience isn't told that there's editing that is designed to make some characters look good and some characters look bad in order to garner sympathy or outrage and then probably some sort of endorsement contract later on that everyone benefits from because you can't get into these high level established forums without having some sort of connections and without having the right agents and so the whole point of social media was actually to, demo to, to create a more democratic method of reaching the public. And obviously that has some downsides. Obviously, if you are part of the establishment and you're able to create, let whoever you want pass through your gates and deny others as well, you're going to have a, the opportunity to at least more strictly manage quality. That's not actually what's happened, but in theory, that's what should have happened. The problem with social media is essentially the same problem as democracy, is that the more you make something accessible, the more problems you have overall. And the idea, if you think about it, is not to ban democracy, not to censor this political idea, even though, of course, with the the United States is not a pure democracy. It's, an, it's a democratic republic because of the electoral college. And so even a few hundred years ago, people understood the problems with a truly democratic system. But no one is out there saying, let's ban dem democracy. They, they would, that would be foolish. And yet, when it comes to, quote unquote, this, these arguments of deplatforming people, of not allowing the other side equal time, these arguments are somehow accepted. This speaks to not only a deficiency in the public discourse, but also a deficiency in education. Because it should be quite obvious that if you're able to let whoever's in power, especially in a country like the United States, where only about seven companies control what your eyeballs see. Or maybe 10 if you include all the social media. If you put that, put all these factors together, whenever you hear somebody saying that you shouldn't give equal time to this group, which happens to be the one that I dislike, or which happens to be the one that the majority dislikes, the first thing you should think about is why are you allowing someone else who doesn't know you to be able to determine what you see. And this isn't something that's a minority viewpoint. This, isn't, this is accepted. Whenever you have somebody that has committed a mass atrocity, the first thing that happens in America is that the person's social media is taken down. The manifesto, almost always is a manifesto, is taken down and it becomes very difficult to find it later on. Because the internet is a democratic medium, you can never truly remove any content. And consequently, what's happened as a result of this deplatforming, aka censorship movement, is the rise in, I, I guess you could call them free speech martyrs, where by putting them into the shadows, they've simply made them stronger and by giving them publicity. Because people, you know, human beings are curious. We want to see what is being denied us. And that's always been an advertising strategy is to you know, paint something as you know, 
as outrageous and in doing so attract more people to it than what would otherwise have been justifiable on the original merits. And so today you can still find, if you're somewhat of an expert, any content that's been banned, if you're in, if you happen to have the right timing. And so at that point, you're dealing with a, an even more problem, problematic issue, which is that you've got security forces in your own country to the extent that you try to publish these unofficially banned documents, whether it's WikiLeaks or whether it's a leaked to celebrity news photo, you've got your own government and your own apparatus, whether it's public or private, attempting to shut down citizen speech, which is also the same thing as attempting to shut down citizen journalism. When you put all these things together, there's the democratic nature of technology today, the, the fact that banning speech in most cases simply amplifies the message to the extent that you're dealing with any sort of connected or dedicated group. And when you put all these things together, it should be fairly obvious that the issue is not the platforming, is not quote unquote equal time. It's really authenticity. It's really this idea that these, that the technocrats who created these problems of inauthenticity, of inauthenticity, of fake news, of deep fakes, of manipulating photos of photos of adding audio to videos that is not originally there <sighs> when you put all these things together you again the problem is you have an entire security apparatus an entire propaganda network that in order to achieve its aims wants inauthentic information out there but only the inauthentic information that it deems valid for its own purposes. The most obvious example is the, is the invasion of Iraq. The CIA told the President of the United States that it was a slam, quote unquote slam dunk, that there were, were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, in a documentary called The Spy Masters, that person, Tenet, now admits there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. We were wrong, quote, he says. I believe it's George Tenet. And furthermore, this is where it gets really interesting, Tenet says that, that the idea of weapons of mass destruction was, not, was essentially a selling point of the Iraq war. It was designed to sell the war. The United States was going to invade anyway. And so during a, a strategic session, the question was how to sell the war to the American public. And they decided that the way to sell the war would be weapons of mass destruction because they were certain that Iraq had them. This is also backed up by General Wesley Clark, who not only said that the invasion of Iraq was after 9-11 was um, essentially already set, but also the invasions of other countries like Syria were already being planned. And it had nothing to do with the story that the American public was told about weapons of mass destruction. And so when you really, really, really get right down to it, you start to understand that the inauthenticity is there by design. It's there because different propaganda networks, some private and some public, either want to go to war or they want to convince you that a particular candidate is the one that's going to, is the, is the one that, that, that's most favorable. Typically whoever maintains the status quo. And of course, the funding. So the real problem with this deplatforming movement, with everything that we've been taught is a problem, is that it not only diminishes free speech, it also ignores the context of inauthentic speech, which is, again, there by design in order to manipulate political outcomes. And you know, the military in the United States, I think we spend more than, the United States spends more than 10 times what Russia spends on its military. A lot of that might just be to, due to the surveillance apparatus 
data collection and so on and so forth. Um, Putin in Russia claims that Rush the Russians do not have a quote unquote mass surveillance program similar to the NSA. Uh, they do, they have passed a law that allows them to preserve telephone records um, and telephone communications in the event of a criminal prosecution. But you can, you know, the argument is that the Russians are not in a position where they want to spend the kind of money that the Americans do on mass surveillance. And yet we're being told in America, that the Russians who have a 10th of the budget that we do for the military are somehow able to influence our elections um, with a 10th of the budget. Now, again, that should tell you that we're living in a world where everything you see is propaganda. And so when someone tells you they want to deplatform de somebody or not give equal time to somebody else, there are legitimate reasons for not giving equal time to somebody else. And that would be a track record of failure in a public debate. Simply not being able to hold your own against somebody on a regular basis or simply repeating the same sorts of lies. But really what we have to get to is a point where a private technology company can figure out what content is being uploaded into the, pub into the public sphere that is fake. Once we're able to do that, then we can talk about deplatforming. Then we can talk about maybe a three strike system. We can talk about a warning system, a notice system, a due process system. We don't have any of that now. We probably won't again, because a country that has a military budget as large as ours probably needs to manipulate images and content in order to influence its activities, both at home and overseas.